Krishna, dear devotees, welcome back to our ongoing series on the glories of our beloved Vrindavan Dham and many of the great uh, Acharyas who spent time there. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pashtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nipishesha Shunyavari Pashata Deshatarane. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. So today, I would like to discuss, um, again, another uh, acharya, very dear acharya, who um, spent time in the Dham, in Vrindavan, and that is the illustrious uh, Janava Devi, sometimes known as Janava Mata, also known as uh, Janava Ishwari. She is the famous wife of Lord Nityananda. And in the 11th wave of the Bhakti Ratnakara, Srila Narahari Chakravarti glorifies her with a beautiful prayer. <coughs> he says, um, Nityananda Pariyam Prema Bhakti Ratna Prada Yinim Shijanava Ishwaram Bande Tapa Traya Nivarnam. He says, quote, I offer my obeisances to Sri Janava Devi, Lord Nityananda's dear wife. To the general mass of people, she gives the precious jewel of devotional service. In this way, she vanquishes the threefold miseries of material existence." Unquote. And like all the um, great acharyas we've discussed in recent months, we can begin to appreciate who Janavadevi is <coughs> by first um, discussing her identity and her service in the spiritual world in Goloka Vrindavan. Srila Prabhupada helps us in that regard. He states in a purport in Chaitanya Charitamrita Adi Lila 1121. Uh, he writes, quote, All the associates of Lord Nityananda were formerly cowherd boys in Brajabhumi. Their symbolic representations with the horns and sticks they carried, their cowherd dress, and the peacock plumes on their heads. Janava Mata is also within the list of Lord Nityananda's followers. She is described in the Gora Gonadesha Dipika, text number 66, as Ananga Manjari in Sri Vrindavan Dham. Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> so, of course, we know uh, that Ananga Manjari is the, um, the younger sister of Sri Mati Radharani. And I read that Ananga Manjari takes birth in Varshana, and, quote, shadows Srimati Radharani as little girls often do their elder sisters, unquote. <laughs> shadows Srimati Radharani as little girls often do their elder sisters. She's described as um, <coughs> 13 years old. She has a, a golden complexion, and she dresses in clothes the color of blue lotuses. And as a Manjari, she serves both Radha and Krishna by offering them uh, sandalwood pulp scented with camphor. As Rupa Manjari places garlands of jasmine flowers ar uh, um, around the divine couple's necks. Um, she also stands guard over Radha and Krishna when they're resting. And if any monkeys are nearby, she signals some other Manjaris to scare them away. It's one of her services. Another one of her services is that when a new gopi joins Krishna's pastimes after her release from the material world, someone's achieved perfection in gopi bhav, <laughs> it's Ananga Manjari who greets that gopi and welcomes her to Vrindavan. And she introduces that new gopi to other gopis. And she arranges a, her, her residence and she gives her her first service to the divine couple. Nice seva. And I was really happy to read that one of her principal places of Leela or pastimes in Vrindavan is a secret island hidden in the very center of Radhakund. And uh, from the shore of Radhakund to that secret island, um, there's a special bridge that goes there. It's on the northern shore, connects, you know, the shore to the secret island. And um, this secret island of hers resembles a 16-petaled a, a lotus floating in the water. 
and it's called uh, Salila Kamala Kunj. Shalila Kamala Kunj. And it's sometimes referred to as Svananda Shukanda Kunj. Svananda Sukanda Kunj. And it's covered with um, emeralds and rubies and moonstones. And along the island's uh, waterline are, quote, intricately carved forms of swans and lilies set with valuable gems that bob, uh, you know, move up and down with the waves of Radhakund. And they appear like real swans playing amongst um, uh, other clusters of lilies. <laughs> and in the center of this island is a, a golden cottage inlaid, inlaid with moonstones. And it's there, it's described uh, there, Srimati Radharani blissfully makes arrangements for her younger sister, Ananga Manjari, who's described as the embodiment of youthful perfection, to be alone with Krishna. So many wonderful details of <laughs> our home, <laughs> the spiritual world. <laughs> and uh, in my research, I found the Ananga Manjari Ashtakam. I didn't know there was one. The Ananga Manjari Ashtakam, eight prayers in, in glorification of Radharani's um, little sister, who appeared as Janava Mata in this world. <clears throat> so to set the scene, let's recite the um, Ananga Manjari Ashtakam. I bow down to Ananga Manjari, who is the embodiment of all the gopis' love. Her heart is softened by the effulgent rays emanating from the lotus feet of Sri Radha and the son of Nanda Maharaj. I bow down to the lotus feet of Ananga Manjari, whose extraordinary uh, bodily beauty puts to shame the splendor of a host of golden springtime ketaki flowers. She is expert in performing playful pastimes and arranging the rendezvous of the divine couple. <coughs> I bow down to Ananga Manjari, whose face is a repository of the nectar poured forth by millions of moons. Her beautiful cheeks are reddish like bimbo, fr bimbo fruit, and she is the churning pot of rasa produced from the festival of meeting with Mukunda. I bow down to Ananga Manjari, who wears a jeweled belt on her waist. Her beautiful curling hair reaches down to her feet. I bow down to Ananga Manjari, who is the younger sister of Sri Radha and is as dear to her as life. She has learned the art of happiness in friendship with Vishaka, <laughs> and the sweetness of her limbs is seen in her loving pastimes. I bow down to Ananga Manjari, whose brilliant garments mock blue lotus flowers. She always manifests the sweetness of the twelfth year going into the thirteenth year, and she wears a crimson dress. I bow down to Ananga Manjari, who stays in Ananga Nandam Bujukunja, another name, in the middle of Radhakund. Her service as a messenger is overseen by Lalita Saki, and she is the topmost assistant in serving the loving pastimes of Srimati Radharani. I bow down to Ananga Manjari, whose jeweled earrings swing on her cheeks and whose divine form resembles a creeper with the hue of molten gold. Sri Ananga Manjari, the daughter of Brishabhanu, will bestow the desired service to her lotus feet upon anyone who recites this ashtaka, which extols her wonderful qualities. Hare Krishna, Sri Ananga Manjari ki. We got to know her better <laughs> from that beautiful ashtakam. So it's a little technical, but when Ananga Manjari uh, descended into this world to assist um, Mahaprabhu's pastimes as um, Jonathan Mata, she actually expanded herself as two personalities, Janava Devi and Vasudha. The Gaur Ganadisha Topeka says, <coughs> quote, Some say that um, Srimati Vasudha Devi is the incarnation of Sri Ananga Manjari, 
And others say that Srimati Janava Devi is the incarnation of Srimati Ananga Manjari. In truth, uh, both opinions are correct. <laughs> so Vasuda and Janava took birth as sisters. And later, um, Lord Nityananda married both of them. So this can raise a question. How can one person in the spiritual world um, become two persons in the material world for, for Leela, for pastimes? In other words, how did Ananga Manjari become the Lady Vasuda <coughs> and the Lady Janava, who took birth as sisters and were married by Lord Nityananda? <laughs> how does one person become two persons? Well, the philosophical answer is that um, a, a person in the in doing so, a person in the spiritual world shares a small amsha or part of their potency in the newly incarnated person uh, or persons in this material world. In this case, Ananga Manjari invests some of her potency into Vashuddha and Janava. This means that the, uh, a person in the spiritual world stays in the spiritual world, but just expands their amsa, which is, you know, them, <laughs> their potency, into the person or the persons in the material world. They stay there, but their full potency. This is uh, spiritual mathematics, you could say. <laughs> just like before Krishna appeared on this planet, Brahma got a message from the Lord. Brahma got a message from the Lord. The message was, Bhavad, bi bhavad bir amshar uh, yadu shupa janyatam. Quote, all demigods should take birth uh, through their amshas, their plenary portions, their potency in the yadu dynasty. This was an instruction from Krishna to, to Brahma that all the demigods, they should come to participate in, in his pastimes in the yadu dynasty um, through their amshas, through their potencies. And in this regard, I did some research. The, the great Vaishnav commentator, who we like to quote, Shri Hari Shuri, he po poses a question. He said, he writes, Why did the Lord ask the demigods to take birth in partial plenary portions, in umphas, in their potencies? And he answers his own question. And I'll quote him. What better to quote him? <laughs> he writes, quote, the answer is that if the demigods come entirely in their complete manifestation on the earth, then who will enjoy the pleasures meant for the demigods in heaven? And who will carry out the tasks of maintaining the universe? Therefore, the demigods have to appear only in part, not in whole. And what is that part? It's an amsa, it's a potency, but very powerful. So just as the demigods, they expand into Krishna's pastimes 5,000 years ago. So um, 500 years ago, Ananga Manjari, she expanded as Vasudha and uh, Janava Devi in umsas and partial manifestations. I could think of another example, and that's um, Haridash Thakur. We all, well, many of us know that from studying them, Haridash Thakur is a combination of Brahma and Prahlad. We had a class on that many, many months ago. I think there was even one other personality involved <laughs> in Haridash Thakur, a Brahmana. Um, but Brahmana, uh, uh, Brahma and, and Prahlad, that's who Haridash Thakur is. It means that part of Haridash Thakur's body, mind, and you could say soul, is, is part of Brahma's potency and part of Prahlad's potency. This is how we understand it. It doesn't mean that, you know, Brahma and Prahlad have taken new bodies and, and given up their existing posts or, or positions, but they, they only bestow a part of their potency into the personality of Haridash Thakur. And that Haridash Thakur uh, is thus facilitated in his, um, in his service to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. I hope this is all clear. It's important to discuss that Krishna consciousness is a science in the real sense. And that science is revealed to us. The details are revealed to us by our, by our charyas. 
So we know who, um, we know Ananga Manjari much better now in the spiritual world, and we, we know that she expanded as two persons, Vashuddha and uh, Janava Devi in Lord Chaitanya's pastimes. And both these girls, sisters, eventually became the wives of Lord Nityananda. But I was reading <coughs> that um, Janava Devi became more prominent amongst the two as a great acharya for all uh, Gaudiya Vaishnavas. Now, um, if we want to make it even a little more complicated, <laughs> the uh, Gora Gonadesha Dipika by our Kafi Karnapur, again, he says in verse 65 that Lord Balaram's two wives, Varuni Devi and Revati Devi, appeared during Lord Chaitanya's pastimes as Vasudha Devi and Janava Devi, the two wives of Lord Nityananda and the daughters of the great personality, Surya Das. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Two statements like that. We'll move on. Um, Vashuddha and Janava, as mentioned in this verse um, that we just quoted, they took birth, or they appeared in the family of um, Surya Das. I think his last name was Sarakela. And his wife was uh, Bhadravati. Two very pure and eternal associates of the Lord in the village of Shaligram, near Navadweep, Shaligram. There's little, or I couldn't find anything about their youth until these two um, Vaishnavis uh, reached the meritable age. <coughs> it was around that time that um, Lord Chaitanya requested um, Lord Nityananda to marry. Nitai had been a, a renunciate up until that time, actually an avadut. <laughs> and, uh, but Mahaprabhu felt it was necessary that Nityananda marry to set a proper example for householders um, in the age of Kali. Mahaprabhu himself was the best example uh, for renunciates. But in any age, the vast majority of the population, of course, are married folks, married people. So Lord Chaitanya, he set an excellent example um, for the renounce, renounced order of life, but he wanted to set a good example, have someone set a good example for the um, Gurihasta order of life, and he chose Lord Nityananda. In the uh, Sri Nityananda, Nityananda Vamsa Vishtar, which is um, attributed, attributed to uh, Srila Vindavan Das Thakur, we hear Lord Chaitanya's actual words regarding this marriage arrangement. <laughs> he said to, um, to Nitai, My dear Nitai, I would like you to go to Bengal and enter family life. Then only can all the householders be delivered. By entering family life, you will be able to better propagate bhakti, or devotion to Krishna everywhere. So therein it's also stated, Nitai's reply. <coughs> Nitai replies, My dear Lord, you are my life and soul. You are the dearest friend of my life. You are the wealth of my heart. You are indeed the Lord of my life. I'm, I, I'm eternally your, quote, order-carrying servant, unquote. Therefore I cannot ignore your command. I place it upon my head. I love that. We take the order of our guru, take the order of the Lord, and we place it on our head. So then um, Bhakti Ratnakara describes how one night this um, Surya Das from Shaligram, he had a wonderful dream. And in this dream, he saw the beautiful form of Nityananda Mahajan. <laughs> sitting on a raised platform, wearing beautiful clothes and ornaments, on his, and on his right and left sides were his two daughters, Vashuddha and Janava, sitting as his brides. So Suryadasa immediately woke up 
And in ecstasy, ecstasy he was thinking, how, how is this possible that my daughters could marry such an illustrious personality as Nityananda? <laughs> Nityananda Mahajan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So immediately sent a message begging Nityananda Prabhu, who was in Navadweep at this time, to accept his girls in marriage. So it's described when, you know, Nityananda Prabhu got this letter, this proposal, you know, although he'd already been ordered by Mahaprabhu, he, he um, read this out loud to his associates. Uh, I think Srivash Thakur, Advaita Acharya, and um, Marari Gupta were there. And when they heard this proposal, they began chanting and dancing in ecstasy. And when Nityananda Prabhu saw their enthusi enthusiasm and with a grateful heart, he said, yes, I accept this proposal. <laughs> so uh, other Shastras go into more detail, saying that when um, Lord Nityananda arrived at the home of this Suryadas, Suryadas, the Leela is that he expressed, now he expressed some hesitation. <laughs> he said to Nitai, sir, how can a member of the renounced order become a householder? It's against the rules of Varnashram Dharma. This is the Leela. But not wishing to argue the point, Nitai just, all right, <laughs> he left. <laughs> he walked away. But Vashuda, Vashuda had been in the next room and she'd overheard this conversation and eternally bound to Lord Nityananda as his consort because she's the eternal consort of Nitai and his Grihastra Leela. And of course, Nitai is Balaram, and she's there in Balaram's pastimes, as we heard from that other verse in Gorgonadisha Dupika. Hearing this, you know, overhearing this conversation that her eternal consort left, she fell unconscious. She fell unconscious when she heard her father reject Lord Nityananda. And discovering her in this state, one of her maidservants called out very loudly in the home, Oh, Vasuda, what has happened to you? So everyone came running. And by this time, Vasuda's limbs had become numb, her eyes were rolled back, and her body was quickly becoming cold. So Ayurv Ayurvedic physicians were called in, but they said, there's nothing we can do. Within a short time, it appears She's going to leave her body. <laughs> She's going to die. So make the preparations for her departure. So crying and weeping, you know, her maidservants carried her body down to the Ganges and, you know, everyone was having kirtan and, and they built a funeral pyre <laughs> for cremation. <laughs> so hearing this terrible news, uh, Surya Das realized his grave mistake and he ran into, into town to find Lord Nityananda. And when he found him, he begged the Lord to save his daughter. She's on the verge of death. This is, you know, one uh, of the symptoms of um, ecstatic love for the Lord, devastation. We talked about that the other day, when one, the eight symptoms of ecstatic love of God. One is devastation. Devastation means everything, everything's got finished. So he, he begged the Lord, my daughter's dying. She's about to leave her body. Please save her. So Nitai said, okay, but only if you agree she can marry me. <laughs> so Suryadas, he very happily agreed, and they went down to the river where everyone had gathered for the cremation. <coughs> it's so nicely described. As Lord Nityananda came close to Vashudha's body, it's described a breeze brushed, brushed against his body, Nitai's body, and it, it, it carried this exquisite fragrance of the body of Nityananda to Vashudha's nostrils. And at that very moment, she sprang back to life and rose up like a thunderbolt. And in doing so, I thought it was very interesting, she immediately covered her hair out of shyness. <laughs> and it's described that um, Lord Nityananda's bodily fragrance acted like the, el the elixir of immortality, 
which brought Vashuddha back to life. The elixir of immortality, which brought Vashuddha back to life. The aroma of the body of the Lord. Hare Krishna. <coughs> so within a very short time, um, the auspicious marriage um, with um, Vashuddha and um, uh, Janava Devi that was um, that was arranged. Both girls were to be married to um, to Lord Nityananda, the two of them. And um, I, I was reading that that before the ceremony took place, you know, Nitai's there and the two girls, they sisters, they they walk in to be married to Lord Nityananda, with whom they have a eternal relationship, as Varuni <laughs> and um, and Varuni and Revati in uh, Krishna Lila as well. They were coming in, but before the whole ceremony began, uh, I was reading there was this huge, long, ecstatic, extended kirtan. Because everyone knew that there was nothing that pleases Nitai more than to hear the loud chanting of Krishna's holy names. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So that was very much part of the uh, Vedic ceremony, the um, the yagya of um, Lord Nityananda with those two girls. And actually in anything in Krishna consciousness, any of our Vedic ceremonies, they're all meant to be accompanied by the Yuga Dharma of chanting the holy names. So afterwards, um, Lord Nityananda and his um, two wives settled in uh, Kandahar, Kandahar. And Bhakti Ratnakara says that although Vasudha and uh, Janava Devi were performing all their domestic duties in the most perfect way, it was all for one purpose, and that was to facilitate their husband's um, mission to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And as time went on, um, Janava Devi didn't uh, bear any children, but Vasudha gave birth to um, uh, Bira Chandra um, and Ganga Devi. Vira Bhadra, sometimes it's said, or Bira Chandra. And um, the Shastra states that these two children were um, Shiradakshai Vishnu, Bira Bhadra, Bira Chandra, and um, Ganga Devi was the um, the river Ganges personified. Those are the two children whom she gave birth to. And in time, we're moving forward here, um, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu left this world, Gadadhar Pandit left this world, Srub Damodar left this world, Advaita, Srivas, and of course, Lord Nityananda Prabhu as well. And it was at that point that devotees from everywhere turned to uh, Janava Devi as their leader. N Nityananda Das writes in Prema Vilas that one day uh, Birabhadra saw uh, Janava in a, in a forearm form and decided to accept her as his um, Diksha Guru. Right? Actually, technically, she's his aunt. He's the um, son of Vashuddha, and Vashuddha and uh, Janava Devi, her sister, so that makes he that makes her his uh, Janava, his aunt. So he decided to accept her as his Diksha Guru, and he became her initiated disciple. We'll discuss that, I think, next lecture in more detail because I think I'm going to speak about um, Mitra Chandra uh, in the next lecture. Anyway, when the word spread throughout the Vaishnav world <coughs> that the highly respected Mirabhadra or Chandra had taken initiation from uh, Janava Devi. People from everywhere came to take initiation from her, and her fame spread. And, and she actually became accepted as the prominent leader amongst Gaudiya Vaishnavas. And this is one reason that Naratam Das Thakur later invited her as the topmost guest to that, remember that festival he organized, the first Gaur Purnim festival he organized in Keturi, where he installed the five Krishna deities and the golden Garanga deity. She was the main guest. 
And remember how th at that moment there was the big, the, the big kirtan after the installation, how she glanced at Naratam and infused him with a special potency in his kirtan. And that kirtan uh, caused Lord Chaitanya and his associates to descend. They'd all departed years earlier, but she infused Naratam with a potency to call the Lord into the kirtan. <laughs> Very special personality, so highly respected. And remember, she also presided over the discussions at that festival, establishing the, um, the proper doctrine of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement, which we follow down to this very day. <coughs> and we remember she organized the famous Holi festival afterwards, where colors were mixed with perfumes and everyone enjoyed the fun. And the next morning, she, she was an excellent cook. She personally cooked with some helpers um, a, the breakfast prasadam for all the, all the devotees that had attended that festival. And with her own hands, she distributed that prasadam. So the following day, after the three-day event of the um, first Gorpanim festival, she um, surprised everyone by telling Naratam Dashtakur, now I will go to Vrindavan. Now I will go to Vrindavan. This was the year 1582. And on that day, she actually left with a small retinue, a small group of disciples and admirers, etc. Actually with some guards, I also read, to, to walk for three months to Braj, to that transcendental abode. And her journey, I had so much fun. Her, her journey is described again in the 11th wave of the Bhakti Ratnakara. The chapters are called Waves. <laughs> in the ocean of the nectar of devotion, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. <laughs> so their journeys describe. And in every village her party passed through, it's described that people, just upon seeing Janava Devi and hearing her sweet discourses, she was an expert speaker on devotion to Krishna, they would surrender and become her disciples. Then one day they, ca they all came to a village where almost everyone was a devotee of the demigoddess Chandi. Chandi is a very ferocious form of the ferocious goddess Kali. Kali her herself accepts meat, fish, and wine from her followers. So Chandi is a, a ferocious form of the goddess Kali. <coughs> almost everyone was a devotee of Chandi in that village. But when some pious persons came to offer respects to Janava Devi and her um, group of devotees as they entered into the village, some other evil-minded, envious people began blaspheming Janavi, Janava Devi. They said, uh, quote, Why are these foolish, ignorant people in our town bowing down to this ordinary woman, Janava Devi? Who does she think she is? Uh, in this town, we only bow down to the goddess Kali, to Chandi. So Bhakti Ratnakara says that that evening, all of these rascals, these blasphemers, they went to the goddess Chandi's temple and prayed to her to kill Janava Devi and all her followers. To kill Janava Devi. However, that night when all these offenders were sleeping, in their respective residences, Chandi Devi appeared in each one of their dreams simultaneously, screaming in anger and waving her sharp sword in the air. And she said to each of those offenders, quote, O oh, wretched blasphemers, your sorrows will never end. Today I will sever your heads from your bodies. Intoxicated with pride, you chew and devour your own selves. <laughs> you do not know that this saintly person, John of Adavi, is the, who you tried to curse. You do not know that I bow down before her. She is worshipped by all. She is John of Adavi, the wife of Lord Nityananda. When her name is chanted, know that all miseries fly away. 
John of a Davy, John of a Davy, John of a Davy, John of a Davy. <laughs> when her name is chanted, all miseries flee far away. So the next morning it's described, um, all, the, all of these offenders could be seen running from their homes through the streets to where uh, John of a Davy was. And one by one they fell at her feet and begged forgiveness. And John of a Davy, true to her nature, John of a Mutta, she smiled and forgave them all. And she not only forgave them, but she showered the blessings of Lord Nityananda Prabhu upon them. And then she sat with them for many hours and shared with them the secrets of the science of bhakti uh, and the glories of, of, of the Sankirtan movement of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and her illustrious husband, Nityananda, who introduced the Yuga Dharma of chanting the holy names. And by her mercy, all of these offenders quickly became pure Vaishnavas. And as uh, Janava uh, Devi and her followers were leaving that village, everyone was weeping and crying in separation to see her leave. I read that even today when people of that village uh, remember this pastime of their ancestors, they simply start crying. That's what I read. Even today when people remember this, they, these are the ancestors. How she left their village, they cry. <laughs> and um, then I read that um, on her way to another village, as she passed, of course, obviously you're, you're going from, you know, Bengal to Vrindavan. You pass through many towns and villages. So on the way uh, through, on the way to another village, a group of thieves saw John of Devi and her group. And thinking that they were carrying valuables, they made this plan to attack them. The plan was to attack them as they slept in the forest at night. So that night, around midnight, when Janava and all her followers were sound asleep under some trees in the forest, this gang of 30 robbers in pitch darkness snuck up within about 50 meters of, of all the devotees. And they waited there in the total darkness as their, you know, dacoit leader uh, gave them the sign to attack. And then at the right moment, the leader made some special noise and all of these dacoits, they jumped up and started running in the direction of the sleeping devotees with their swords raised, you know. It's only 50 meters, but they put up their swords and, you know. And then Shasta describes Bhakti Ratnakara, they ran and they ran and they ran and they ran. In fact, Bhakti Ratnakara says, they ran all night. <laughs> And as the sun started rising, they were still running. What is this, six hours later? And when they could finally see something, they, look, they looked around and they saw they were in the exact same spot where they had started running. <laughs> they hadn't moved in single inch or centimeter or whatever. So terrified, Bhakti Ratna describes, terrified, they all concluded, quote, from this day on, we will renounce our occupation of plundering. We have committed sins without end. Nothing will save us from Yamaraja's wrath. Let us go to these Vaishnavas and their leader <laughs> and beg forgiveness. Certainly, they will be merciful to us." Unquote. So, once again, Janavid Devi showed her mercy by forgiving these thieves. On the condition, they gave up their rascal ways of life and they chanted the holy names, which they did. But as I read on, wow, it became really interesting. Bhakti Ratnakara says that the leader of those thieves, that the chief robber or dacoit, he was feared by everyone in the land. And when people, when the news spread that he'd been converted into a peaceful Vaishnava by uh, Janava Devi, Everyone came to see if it was true. They came for days, they came for weeks, they came for months, this huge um, influx of people to, to see if, you know, he was, he, that the king of the Dacoits, he was called, if he had, he'd actually been reformed. 
So when they came to see this reformed king of the Dacoits, he preached to each and every person who came and made them into Vaishnavas. As he was made into a Vaishnava, they were made into Vaishnavas. And eventually he was uh, given permission to initiate. And, and he started traveling. And he made thousands and thousands of disciples. <laughs> and under his supervision, I read, the Sankirtan movement spread like wildfire, far and wide. It made me rem remember a, um, a verse from the Garga Samhita, chapter 15, verse 46. Shatam paryantanam shantam girhinam sanyate shmitam nuinam antash tamo hari shadur eva na bashkara sadhu eva na bashkara Quote, The wandering of saints is meant to bring peace to the householders. It is a saint and not the sun that removes the darkness in the hearts of men. The wandering of saints is meant, to bring, is meant to bring peace to the householders. It is a saint and not the sun that removes the darkness in the hearts of men. Garga Samhita. Now, we often, we've often said in our lectures that um, a devotee's fame precedes them, or him, or her. And that is certainly true of um, John of Devi. Janava Mata, Janava Ishwari. <laughs> For when she finally arrived in Vrindavan, as she approached a small clearing, as you cross into the frontier there, um, on the pathway, just on the border of, of Vrindavan, was a large assembly of distinguished acharyas and saints assembled to greet her. And as she approached this august assembly, she turned to one of her uh, followers, who had previously been in Vrindavan and said, my dear Param Eshwari Das, that was his name, Param Eshwari Das, what are the names of these saints who have come to greet me? And on her command, Param Eshwari Das, with tears you know, streaming down his face, looking at all these saints waiting to greet her, he pointed to them and he said, my dear Janava Devi, just there is she Gopal Bhatta Goswami, who was filled with divine love for Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And look, over there is Bhugarbha Goswami and Lokanath Goswami, who are the abodes of spiritual virtues. And just see over there is Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami. And there's Madhu Pandit. And there, over there, is the most illustrious saint, Srila Jiva Goswami. So he you know, there's a whole <laughs> list there that goes on. Isn't that wonderful? They all came to greet her. And as she drew near to these saints, um, they all came, in, uh, came forward and fell at her feet. And then in the perfect culture of, of Vaishnavism, those Vrindavan Acharyas and many saints from Vrindavan, they inquired from Parameshwari, us. Would you please introduce us to those who have come along with uh, Janava uh, Devi? Who is this entourage that have come with her? So then Bhakti Ratnakara says, with a joyful heart, Sri Param Eshwari Das introduced um, Srinivas Acharya's disciples who had come on the journey to all of those Goswamis in Vrindavan. With affection, he said, just see, you uh, great acharyas of Braj, this person has come with uh, Janava Devi. His name's Govinda Das. He's filled with the nectar of devotional service. He's the life's breath of all the Vaishnavas. He is the son of Cheranjeev Sain, and he lives in Kanda. He's the younger brother of Ramchandra Kaviraj, unquote. So in this way, Parmeshwari, he, he introduced each and every devotee in Janava Devi's, uh, Janava, uh, Devi's entourage to the Goswamis. 
And after each devotee was introduced, I was reading, these Vrindavan Goswamis would tightly embrace that devotee with love. Everyone who came. This exchange probably took some hours, you could say. Embrace them in love. And I was thinking, <clears throat> again, this is our culture. A culture of respect. A culture of love, ultimately. We respect and honor our leaders, and the leaders themselves show warmth, love, and appreciation for each member of the society. This is Vaikuntha. This is Goloka. So seeing all these exchanges of love going on, Janavadevi became soaked in tears, that f the tears that f flowed from her own eyes. Then letting out a long sigh, <sighs> she offered obeisances to Vrindavan Dham and rolled in the dust. <laughs> wow. And blissfully entered that divine abode. And so too should we. We shouldn't just get out of the taxi and, you know, how are you keeping mine? How's it going there? You know, pay some quick obeisances. We should realize our good fortune in coming to the, this eternal abode, eternal, full of knowledge and bliss, never deteriorates. Where the pastimes of um, Krishna and his devotees are eternally going on. Here in Bhoma Vrindavan, we should get out of the taxi and roll on the ground. And one day, soak our body with tears as well. <laughs> then uh, the devotees escorted her, Janava Devi, to her residence, which had been um, arranged by Jiva Goswami. And after a few hours, um, Gopal Bhatta Goswami and Lokanath Goswami came to pay their respects to her, to, to Janava Devi. And then she told them, um, I would like to see the Vrindavan deities. So they escorted her to see Govindaji, Gopinath, Madan Mohan, uh, Radha Govinda, Radha Raman, Radha Damodar, Radha Sham Sundar. And Bhakti Ratnakara describes, quote, who can possibly describe how Janava Devi became filled with the ecstasy of spiritual love upon seeing these deities so dear to the Goswami's hearts. And while taking darshan of all these deities, Janavadevi offered them all many glorious um, garments and ornaments that she'd brought with her for them, specifically, for each one of them. Then she um, entrusted some of the precious belongings of her beloved departed husband, Lord Nityananda, for safekeeping with Srila Jiva Goswami. She brought these items of, of personal items of uh, Lord Nityananda. She brought them to Vrindavan and she entrusted them to Jiva Goswami, who, ke who kept them uh, sheltered safely in um, <coughs> his... Um, Radha Damodar Temple, which as we mentioned some time ago was actually acting as like the headquarters for the evolving Sankirtan movement of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. She brought with her a Shiva Lingam that Lord Nityananda used to wear around his neck. She brought um, with her um, his wooden sandals and she brought two sets of jewels that had been worn around, you know, one set of jewels around Nitai's left arm and one set of jewels around his right arm while he did Harinam Sankirtan back in uh, Navadweep in the early days when they started the Sankirtan movement. Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda would go out and they, they'd, um, you know, they were, weren't, weren't renunciates at that time and um, in Navadweep and they went out, you know, in a very, um, looking very gorgeous, you know, their long hair flowing, long black hair flowing. They had, uh, Nitai was in blue garments and, you know, they're chanting and dancing and they had uh, jewelry on, you know, to attract the common man, <laughs> how beautiful they were. So on, Lord, Ni Lord Nityananda used to wear Navaratnas, it means nine jewels on his left arm and nine jewels on his right arm. 
through the centuries, um, the Shiva Lingam and the wooden sandals were lost or stolen or sold, unfortunately. Um, so in the 1950s, one of the main priests um, of the Radha Domodar Temple brought the remaining items, which meant the, this uh, two sets of Navaratna jewels, um, along with uh, Srila Jiva Goswami's original japa beads. Those were also kept after his departure. And uh, he took all those items and he brought them to his temple, <laughs> his center, which was at Nityanandavat, uh, the first place that Nitai came to when he came to Vrindavan. It was a, it was a beautiful banyan tree. So when Nitai came to Vrindavan, the first place he visited, he, he sat there under that tree near the Jamuna River. It's called Nityananda Vat. Or it's sometimes referred to as Sringara Vat. It's also the place where 5,000 years ago, um, Krishna used to decorate um, Srimati Radharani with jewels there. <laughs> so over many years, um, I, I de I've developed a very close friendship with the Goswami that's in charge there, Anupa Goswami. He's a character. <laughs> He's in the, <laughs> in the mood of Lord Nityananda. And he really appreciated how Srila Prabhupada, um, when he came to the West, installed deities of Gornitai. Because traditionally in the Gaudiya Moth, they would um, have the deity of Lord Chaitanya along with Radha and Krishna, because Lord Chaitanya, Sri Krishna, Chaitanya, Radha, Krishna, and Hai Anga. Lord Chaitanya is the combined form of Radha and Krishna for the purpose of coming into this world and spreading the Sankirtan movement. But interestingly, when Srila Prabhupada came to the West, he, understanding the importance of Lord Nityananda and preaching to the most fallen people, the Jagai and Madhais, he gave us a Gornitai, Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda, and all our temples like that. So um, Anup Goswami very much appreciates, because he's a Nitai Bhakta, <laughs> he very much appreciates how Prabhupada did that, so he has so much affection for a movement. So we developed a close relationship. I sometimes go down there and he allows me to chant on the Japa Mala of um, Srila Jiva Goswami. Some very special mercy. You know, those, those beads are very old. <laughs> they're actually kind of falling apart a little bit. You have to chant on them very carefully, but they're the original Japa Mala of Jiva Goswami. And um, I get to chant on those. And um, one time in a, you know, in our association, we're discussing, you know, Lord Nityananda and his contribution to the Sankirtan movement and how Prabhupada took those teachings to the Western countries. In a moment of emotion, he gave me two of those jewels, two of those 18 jewels w worn by Lord Nityananda 500 years ago. He entrusted them to me. I have them here. I can show you. I put one of them in the form of a ring. This red one here. I can't put it any closer because it goes out of focus. You can see. But this jewel here was one of those jewels that Nitai wore. And um, to safe keep it and make it easily accessible, I put it into, into a ring, which I wear when I do puja and when I do special, go to special programs. Or when I go to the special program of going on the streets of Kali Yuga. <laughs> on Harinam Sankirtan. <laughs> That's our temp one of our temples, isn't it? The street is our temple in Kali Yuga. We feel very close to Nitai and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Panchatattva, Prabhupada out there. So that's one. And the second one I keep on my altar. It's a, it's a blue jewel. You can see, I think if I put it here, it's easier for you to see. A blue jewel. <laughs> And I put it in that form like that. So, Hare Krishna. So two jewels that, that Lord Nityananda wore, brought by Mother Janava. And here's the, um, the sacred um, japa bead from Srila Jiva Goswami's mom. You can see. And sometimes um, I chant my 16 rounds on this one bead. 
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare. I keep count, and I chant 16 rounds on this one bead. Hare Krishna. So these things are entrusted to us, and we must be very careful that in the future they'll be um, given to devotees who will also appreciate them for what they are and, and take full advantage of them or put them into a museum, but I will be very careful about that. Hare Krishna. So let us continue. Um, so news of Janava Devi's arrival spread very quickly in Vrindavan. Bhakti Ratnakara says, news that plunged the devotees into the most sublime bliss. John of the Davies here. <laughs> it's like when Prabhupada came to the, our temples. It's Prabhupada's coming, Prabhupada's here. It was like, wow. <laughs> Special moments in our memory. So news um, that plunged these devotees of Braj into the most sublime bliss. The wife of Lord Nityananda has arrived. And at that time, Raghunath Das Goswami was staying out at Radhakund. And he was very elderly at this time. And he'd I described he became extremely joyful to hear that that uh, Janava Devi had come to Braj, but he had no strength to walk to Vrindavan to see her. Vrindavan proper, the village, not only because of his of the severe austerities that he'd been performing for many years that left his body, you could say, in an emaciated state, but mainly because he was overcome by feelings of separation from Srila Rupa Goswami, who had just departed this world. <laughs> he couldn't do anything. He was just stunned in a state of separation from Srila Rupa Goswami, who would recently departed the world. So because he wasn't able to come to the village of Vrindavan, Janava Devi decided to go to Radhakund for darshan of the kund and to see Raghunath uh, Das Goswami as well. These are historic meetings. This, this is real history. So when she arrived at Radhakund, Bhakti Ratnakar describes their meeting. Quote, When Sri Das Goswami, it's another name for Raghunath Das Goswami, heard this, that she'd arrived, such a wonderful prema pervaded his heart. And he came forward with tear-filled eyes. When Sri Ishwari, another name for Janava Devi, saw how Das Goswami walked, um, how greatly emaciated his body was, but how he shone like the sun, she felt intense bliss within her heart. Who could understand the heart of Sri Ishwari? Who could not stop the tears streaming from her eyes upon seeing Sri Raghunath Das Goswami. His body shone like the sun. <laughs> Although he's emaciated, his body shone like the sun. And here's John of Devi coming forward uh, to, to see him, tears streaming down her eyes, all these deep spiritual emotions. So they met. And after discussing very deep matters of Krishna consciousness with him, she left for a residence provided for her um, at Radhakund. And at that historic um, stay, she stayed for four days at Radhakund. And what did she do while she was there? She prepared prasadam for all the Radhakund vasis, all the all the all the Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis who who were out there at, at Radhakund. She pre every day she prepared prasadam for them. And then one day around noon, uh, Janavadevi Devi heard the sound of a flute towards the northern shore. A Radha Kund. And looking there, she saw Krishna standing under a Kadamba tree in his threefold bending form, playing the flute. But only Janava could see him and hear the flute. Why? Because it's described he was playing the flute just for her. <laughs> and by, um, by his side, uh, Janava Devi saw Srimati Radharani and surrounding the divine couple she saw Lalita, Vishaka as well as, as, well as various um, Manjaris and other gopis. And as she was observing this she suddenly fell to the ground unconscious. 
So that place where Krishna was standing is now known as Janavagata. That's the that's actually, you know, that secret lake that Ananga Manjari has in the middle of Radhakund. And there's a bridge going there. So that, br that bridge begins at that spot. That's the northern shore of Radhakund. And that's Janavagat. It became her sitting place. And those of you who have been there, you know there's a private stairway leading down into Radhakund where Janava would take her sacred bath while she was there. There's very, now when you go there, you'll know how special that place is in Chaitanya Leela and how special that place is in um, Radha Krishna Leela. And nearby, of course, is um, the, a, a Radha Gopinath temple. There's a Radha Gopinath temple at Radha Kund, as well as the most sacred uh, Samadhi Mandir of Sri Raghunath Das Goswami. <laughs> Every step at Radha Kund is permeated with pure nectar. So before um, leaving back for Vrindavan proper, um, Janavadevi Devi requested Raghunath Das Goswami's permission to do Govardhan Parikama. And it's said that only when he gave his blessing did she and her followers proceed on Govardhan Parikama. Bhakti Ratnakara says, quote, With her servants and followers, Janavadevi Devi went from um, Radhakun to Govardhan. How can words describe how Janava Devi became filled with ecstatic love as she gazed at Govardhan Hill, Manasi Ganga, and other holy places there. Hare Krishna. So when she was back in Vrindavan village, one of her principal activities was cooking for the Goswami's deities. And after she cooked for those deities, that she distributed the prasadam herself to various devotees. One day she'd cook for Radha Govinda, the next day she'd cook for Radha Gopinath, the next day she'd cook for Radha Madan Mohan, the next day for Radha Damodar, the next day for Radha Shaman, Shama Sundar, the next day for Radha Raman, like that, while in Vrindavan. And I was reading that she also took great pleasure spending many hours a day in Shravanam Kirtanam, hearing and chanting about the Lord. These are our acharyas. Acharya means one who teaches by example. But even when doing that example, they're relishing on the pure platform of Krishna consciousness, hearing and chanting about the Lord. We're hearing and they're hearing, but there's a different type of quality there <laughs> in which we want to attain. So Bhakti Ratnakara describes how much she enjoyed um, hearing the Bhakti Shastras written by the Goswamis. This was one of my favorite things I came across. Just listen to this. Quote, In her heart, Sri Janavadevi longed to hear the Goswamis' books. Sri Lajiva Goswami read them aloud to her as she listened by hearing Shri Brihad Bhagavatamrita and other books of the Goswamis. Janavadevi became overwhelmed with ecstatic spiritual love. She could not be pacified. While, while seeing her rare and exalted devotional feelings, what person would not feel his heart filled with soothing, soothing bliss? Unquote. So one evening she went to the Radha Gopinath temple and while looking at the deities, she saw that Gopinath was large, whereas Srimati Radharani was a little small. So she thought, Radharani is too small for Krishna. She didn't say anything to anyone. She kept that thought in her heart. But that night, Gopinath appeared to her in her dream. In, in her dream. And he said to her, I mean, we have these insights. <laughs> what did Gopinath say to Janava Devi in her dream? That's like discovering a, the most precious diamond in this planet <laughs> somewhere. He said to her, what you were thinking is correct, Janava Devi. Radharani is too small for me. My instruction for you and my desire is that when you go back to Bengal, construct another deity of Radharani that is suitable for my size and send her back for me to engage with her in our eternal loving relationship. 
And that's what she eventually did. Now this pastime we discussed in more detail in a previous lecture, so we won't go into more. But I, I wanted to mention it because <laughs> it's nice to repeat things about these, these subjects, but um, yeah, we have to move on. Now it's described that uh, one day while visiting the 12 forests of Vrindavan, she, uh, while passing through one particular forest, she heard her mother and father crying for their young child who had just died there in the forest. So Janava Devi, she went over to touch the head of the child as a blessing. But as she did so, the child's mother, she said, oh, please don't touch my son because you'll be contaminated by touching a dead body. Right, don't, don't, don't do that because you'll become contaminated. But Janava De Devi said, quote, dear one, your son is a Braj Basi. He has the body of a Braj Basi. I am touching him for purification of myself. And then when she touched the, the dead boy's head, to everyone's surprise, the boy sprang back to life. Hare Krishna. So many miracles. So after some time, Janava Devi decided to return to Bengal it's described to enthuse the Vaishnavas there. So Bhakti Ratnakara says that when the Goswamis of Vrindavan heard that she was going to leave Vrindavan, quote, their hearts began beating with the pangs of separation that was about to come upon them, unquote. So what, on the day she left, I was reading all the Brachabhasis were weeping and crying and you know, f following behind her, falling at her feet. But she was also weeping and crying and offering her blessings and obeisances to those devotees respectively. And before departing, she went to all of the main temples in Vrindavan to say goodbye to the deities. You know, Radha Gopinath, Madame Mohan, Govindaji, Radha Raman, Radha Damodar, etc. And then she went to see Gopishwara Mahadev, Lord Shiva, and begged for his permission to proceed on her journey. Then she went to Vrindadevi, one of Rupa Goswami's deities, which, whom he discovered in Vrindavan, where she worshipped Vrindadevi and said goodbye. And as she walked out of Vrindavan, Jiva Goswami, he couldn't leave her. He actually followed her all the way to Mathura, I read. <laughs> and then Janava Devi um, proceeded back to Bengal. And years later, on another visit to Vrindavan, I think she made two or three visits to Vrindavan, on, a, on a, another visit to Vrindavan, Janava Devi left this world by entering into the deity of Gopinath. It, it said she walked into the temple, she closed the doors, and she entered into the body of Gopinath. Hare Krishna. Whew. So much nectar. <laughs> How do we process it all? <laughs> Someday we will. So I'd, I'd like to end. Never want to come to the end, right? But with every end, there's a new beginning. At the end of one chapter, there's the beginning of the next chapter. So, again, I think we'll do um, we'll do uh, Vasudha's son, Virachandra, in the next lecture. So, nice pastimes of the two sisters, Vasudha and, and Janava, who came from the spiritual world as Ananga Manjari, or f from Ananga Manjari, or um, Revati or Varuni. Transcendentally complex. <laughs> so let's end today with the most, most, most beautiful prayer to Janava Devi, Janava Mata, Janava Ishwari, by Srila Bhaktivano Thakur. Yes. Seek and ye shall find. I came across a, a beautiful prayer by Bhaktivinoda Thakur 
to Jonathan Davy. It's in his Uchvasa Pratana Danyamayi, song number three. That's from the book Kalyana Kalpaturu. I won't repeat, repeat the Bengali, but I will read each particular verse in this beautiful song. <laughs> Having fallen into this vast ocean of material existence, my heart has become extremely worried. I cannot even find a clue of the means to get some help. I have no strength from fruitive activities or speculative knowledge, nor do I have any help from virtues created by sacrifices, yoga practice, or austerities. I'm extremely feeble, and I don't know how to swim. Who will rescue me from this dreadful calamity? I see the horrible alligator of sense gratification present before me, and the waves of lust are constantly agitating and provoking me. I can no longer cope with all the urges that are pushing me like a raging wind from my previous births. I simply weep with an agitated mind, for I do not see any rescuer in sight. O most revered, Jonathan Davy, please show mercy to this servant today by virtue of your own good qualities and kindly relieve all of his afflictions. By taking shelter of the boat of your lotus feet, I will certainly be able to cross over this vast ocean of material existence. You are the very pleasure potency of Lord Nityananda, and you are the spiritual master of devotion to Lord Krishna. Kindly bestow upon this servant the wish-fulfilling desire tree of your lotus feet. Thus, this most wretched and shameful rogue begs at your feet today, for he sees that you are delivering many other sinners. Shila Bhakti Manvata Kaur Ki Shri Janavidevi Ki Shri Nityananda Mahajan Ki Shri Krishna Sankirtan Yagya Ki The chanting of the holy names Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare What can I say? Thank you again for this opportunity um, to speak about such an illustrious personality. And as we mentioned, we'll continue uh, in, a, in a few days. So, Shishi Gorni Tai Ki, Shishi Krishna Balaram Ki, Shishi Radha Sham Shundar Ki, Brindavaneshwari Shimati Radharani Ki, Janavadevi Ki, Nitai Ki, Gopemanandi. Shira Pawapada Ki Jai Jai Sisi Radhe Sham Hare Krishna Prabhu Thank you